going to hand it over um, to Dr. Zuckerman to give her talk. Thank you for Hi. being here, Dr. Zuckerman. <clears throat> okay, let me get my slide up. Sorry, bear with me. <clears throat> There we go. Oh, sorry guys, hang on. Oh, there we go, I found it. <clears throat> Okay, there we go. Hi. <laughs> um, I apologize for my voice, but I lost it last week and it's not fully back yet. So um, <clears throat> I may have to take a sip of water every now and then. Um, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I have presented once before um, a couple of years ago and I just feel so I don't know, connected to this organization. Um, <clears throat> and I'm really honored to have the chance to speak to you guys again. So obviously um, caregiver stress in any medical illness is extremely difficult. <clears throat> A lot of times more difficult for the caregivers. And it's important that we remember that as caregivers, we need to be able to take care of ourselves, not just for ourselves, but to be better caregivers for those that we're taking care of. And also the people in our family don't just exist with that one person. There's also many other family members that have to be attended to as well. So caregiver stress is something that I've worked on a lot, um, particularly within the area of neurological diseases. So Parkinson's, MS, um, epilepsy. <clears throat> and What's unique about this, unfortunately, is that now we are also in this global pandemic. And because of this, there are so many restrictions that are now in place that don't just affect our daily lives. Yes, my kids are home from school. It's extremely annoying. <laughs> you know, yes, um, we can't go to restaurants. That will change. That will, over time, hopefully go back to what it was. But when you're dealing with a medical illness, the illness continues to progress. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. Life doesn't stop. And so it's very important to understand that caregiver stress, particularly in the time of coronavirus, is going to be something that puts not just the, the patient at risk for increased anxiety and depression, but also the caregivers. So <clears throat> I wanna just talk first about caregiving in general and talk about stress in general and then tie it into why this is different when it pertains to living within this pandemic. <clears throat> so this is the quote I always like to use when I'm talking to caregivers. The passage to the states of caregiving tends to permanently alter the trajectory of the life course, detouring caregivers towards alternate routes and destinations. And if you are a caregiver or ever have been a caregiver, you know that this course is not linear. We can try to predict it as best we can. Doctors can try to predict it as best we can, particularly with seizures. I work with a lot of patients that, I work with adults primarily, but I work with a lot of patients who may have been seizure free for 20 years. But if you ask them what their biggest concern is, it's always, what if I have another one? So as far as anxiety and depression go, it's just not linear, it kind of looks like this. And the goal is to try to neutralize that as much as possible so you're not constantly going through these ups and downs and ups and downs because then you end up not being present in your life when you're in it. So I'm gonna to get to that at the end, but I just wanted to make it clear that if you feel like you're kind of all over the place, that's exactly what it should be. And trying to make it linear will only make you feel like you're hitting your head against the wall. So again, um, another quote I really like, there are only four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who currently are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. So at some point, we will all fall into at least one of these categories. None of us are free from this. So this applies to absolutely everybody, whether or not it applies to you yet, but it eventually will. Um, <clears throat> I put this up here kind of as a 
Um, I like to make fun of it because this is the definition of caregiving if you Google it. And I find that it is the most dismissive definition of caregiving because according to this, caregiving is just a person who provides direct care. I mean, I provide direct care for my two-year-old. I provide direct care to like my dog, <laughs> but caregiving is a full-time job and caregiving doesn't care if you also have another full-time job, if you have four other kids, if you have financial difficulties. Um, so I always just found that this definition is sometimes what other people will view caregiving if they have not experienced it for themselves. And unfortunately, sometimes it falls on us to have to explain or show what caregiving really entails because it is just not this simple. <clears throat> um, this kind of goes to the idea that when you become a caregiver, one of the things from a psychological standpoint that's extremely important is for your definition of caregiving to become much more flexible because what you think you know about caregiving and what other people tell you about caregiving is not going to be your experience. Support groups are super helpful. I have, I have been in many of them to help people um, uh, with adults with epilepsy and other neurological um, issues. And everybody's situation, caregiving situation is so different. They, they overlap, but Every, the way somebody lives a caregiving life, even if two people have the same illnesses, let's say, um, there's so many variables. There's also how you were brought up and what your rules about caregiving are. Is it said in your family that you always take care of the people that are older than you? Is it said in your family that siblings always help other siblings? What's the internal message? So everybody's caregiving style is gonna look different. And when you're in a community of caregivers, like all of you, and you see how one family is going about caregiving versus another family. And you may feel like as a mom or a dad, you're not doing what you should be doing, or you're not doing what you could be doing, and everybody's doing more. And this person knows more about this research, and this person knows more about this medication. How come I don't know about the newest meds and the newest findings and the newest journal and uh, or newest article? Um, and it's just because you don't, because everybody's focused on different things because everybody's caregiving experience looks different. So be very careful and mindful not to judge yourself against somebody else's caregiving style. <clears throat> okay, so stress. I always tell people that <clears throat> if you don't think that you've ever felt stress, that I'm gonna say that you probably have a lot of stomach issues and migraines <clears throat> and back problems because there is just no way that your body does not feel stress. It may not recognize it as psychological stress, but it's there. And a lot of people that don't recognize psychological stress will usually have it come out in terms of lack of sleep, overeating, drinking too much, drug use, um, anger, guilt, um, IBS, any esophageal stuff that I see. Um, um, what else do I say? Weight gain, weight loss. So <clears throat> this stressor is anything that necessitates adaptation and change, which is fine if you're looking at an event that's isolated and episodic. But when you're dealing with a chronic illness that is constantly in flux, even when it's managed well, you can't adapt as well as you could if somebody gets an illness and then it's cured and it does not come back. So adaptation looks very different when you're dealing with um, Dravet syndrome and other types of chronic illnesses that fluctuate over time. Um, and just when you feel like you've gotten a handle on things, and I hear this from my patients a lot, something changes. There's a side effect from the medication, you have to lower the dose. But if you lower the dose, then you have to increase the dose of this one. And if you increase the dose of this one, then they're gonna get groggier, but they're gonna have less seizures. So it's this constant manipulation of medication that keeps you on your toes constantly. Um, when your kids are sleeping and you hear the smallest noise, if you don't have a stress reaction, 
That doesn't even make sense. So parents and caregivers that are taking care of children um, with Dravet syndrome, you're always more like, I shouldn't say always, but more likely than not going to have that fight or flight mode response going on because you have to. Um, whether you want to say it's a parent thing, whether you want to say it's just a caregiver thing, but you're always going to be in some sort of high alert because that's how you're going to deal with your type of stress. I tell people if we didn't have anxiety and stress, we would walk across the street, not look both ways, and we would get hit by a car. So to some extent, anxiety and stress is necessary. It motivates us. So um, anyone that was in graduate school, for example, if you didn't, everyone in grad school has this like subclinical anxiety because if you didn't have it, you wouldn't have made it through, right? So it, it motivates you. Um, it motivates you to do well at your job. If we didn't have it, we would just be flat. So it is a good thing that we have this. We just have to make sure that it doesn't interfere with our functioning. And that's what I'll talk about um, a little bit towards the end. <clears throat> so let's combine anxiety, caregiver stress with COVID. Um, I would imagine that for those caring for somebody with Dravet syndrome, <clears throat> to hear people complain about restaurants being closed and schools not being open is probably one of the most infuriating things that you could possibly hear. Um, and I've had to really um, kind of remind people of that because when you're dealing with a child or an adult who is sick and now there is this uncertain global pandemic where you are automatically high risk because your immune system is already affected. You're already stressed, so your immune system is lower to begin with. Um, it puts you in a really difficult situation. And a lot of other people will not understand it to the degree that you need them to. And this is where people, um, a lot of family arguments came about during COVID. Grandparents weren't allowed over houses anymore. <clears throat> what if grandparents were the primary caretakers? What if both parents were at work? Who's gonna take care of the kid now? Who's gonna take care of the adult now? So COVID wasn't about just closing down restaurants and not being able to get your groceries conveniently and not being able to go to school and not being able to um, go to book club down the street. This really impacted not only mental health, but it impacted caregiving on a whole different level that quite frankly, I hadn't seen discussed at all so when this topic was presented to me to give, I was very excited about it because no one really thinks about this except the people going through it. So um, I wanted to try to help normalize that for you and let you know that what you are feeling is completely normal and hopefully give you some strategies to kind of manage that anxiety because everything's uncertain right now. So no one really knows no one really knows anything. Um, so we have to work within that framework. So let's start with, um, like I said, what if you're an essential worker? What if both of you, both parents, if it's a dual parent household are, are essential workers and the grandparents were the caregivers or an aunt was a caregiver and would come over during the day or you would work in the morning, your shift was in the morning and then you'd come home and, and grandma would leave. So. But grandma also lives with grandpa and grandpa's still at work. And he still goes to work and he's around all these people. And we don't know if they're taking care of themselves. And um, they have little kids and little kids have playgroups. So um, it became a really big issue. And a lot of people lost their jobs. Um, a lot of people were very nervous about health insurance. A lot of people were worried about finances because, as you know, medical bills are not cheap. And fighting with insurance companies is an absolute nightmare. So the biggest thing as far as caregivers go is respite. You must build in structured respite. If you don't, you will not be effective to yourself or to anybody else. You need to take respite and feel guilt at the same time. You need to take a break and at the same time feel like a terrible parent. Um, if you wait to feel less guilty, you're never gonna take it. So when this happened, people's respite schedules, people's 
breaks that they scheduled into their day, maybe they went on the treadmill for 20 minutes in the morning, they can't do that now because there's nobody to watch the person that they're caregiving for. So everybody's schedules went off track. People that have chronic illnesses, they're in that risk category, that high risk category, compromised immune systems. Um, so they have to take greater precautions, which leads to greater isolation, and not just for them, but their entire family. So now you're in this chronic illness group to begin with and feel like people don't understand you. Now, on top of that, we're in this global pandemic that nobody understands really or the mental health impact of it. And now in addition to that, you're isolating yourself. So it's kind of this trifecta for depression and anxiety. Something as simple as doctor's appointments. I had an OB appointment during COVID. I canceled it, no big deal, I'll go in three months. I had a dentist appointment, no big deal, I'll go in three months. You have a child with a chronic illness and you have a doctor's appointment, it is a big deal if you miss that, especially when you have neurologists that have waiting lists and you have other specialists, specialists that you've been waiting for months to see. So it is a big deal because then you have to go. And when you do go, you're putting this person who has a compromised immune system at risk to even take them to the doctor or take them to the hospital. One of the things that people don't understand, and, I, and not to their fault, but with Dravet syndrome and other neurological illnesses, diet plays a huge role in this, the food you eat. If you have limited resources, let's say to go to the market, let's say you could only go on Monday mornings because that's when you know you had care in your house and you could leave and go to the market to get the specialty food you need at the specialty store. Number one, specialty stores were closed. Number two, Amazon delivery was taking weeks. Like little things like that that you wouldn't think of, but when you can't leave your house and you need toilet paper, you couldn't get it. How do you have a child who has a chronic illness and you can't get basic supplies, cleaning supplies, bleach wipes, things that were necessities? Um, so dietary needs was a big thing because if dietary needs are not followed in some situations, it can lead to you know, worsening of health, increased seizures. So you can't mess around with that. And this happened so fast that we didn't really have time to prep for this. Um, injuries, people with Dravet syndrome are automatically at a higher risk for injuries. You're in your house now all the time. Your house is not necessarily set up for 24 seven living. Things will get messier. There's things on the floor more. People can trip easier. There's way more people packed in a house. During the day, how many people are really ever home? Maybe two, maybe none. Now there's five. <clears throat> My house <clears throat> during COVID looked like a bomb went off. I have five people in there just running all over the place. Usually during the day, nobody's home. My house looks very different. There's, 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 not five things being cooked, ovens on and burners on. And so there's, there's a lot more things going on, too many cooks in the kitchen, and it can lead to a lot more um, injuries and just um, unexpected injuries, which then leads us to ER visits. In the middle of a pandemic, the ER is the last place you wanna be. But when you have a child with a chronic illness, Dravet syndrome, that's, that's somewhere that you may have to go in the middle of a pandemic. So you have to kind of think about those stressors as well, which I'm sure you were. Um, but just again, other small anxieties that were, that culminate over time that we don't necessarily pause and realize are occurring simultaneously. Um, okay, so medication changes. We're in the middle of a pandemic. What if you need to make a shift to your meds? What if you need to see the doctor? Some people use mail-in prescriptions. Mail-in prescriptions were slowed down during this. Um, pharmacies had limited hours um, and medications were running short. Same thing I said, dietary stores, delivery was slowed, food stores were closed, specialty stores were closed, stores only had limited hours. So if you were working or you didn't have anyone to stay home to provide caregiving in your absence, how does that happen? Delivery services are extremely expensive. What if you don't have the finances for that? Um, viral, viral transmission, obviously, um, <clears throat> that's kind of 
what's behind all of this. Then throw in financial fears. If you're not working, if you get fired, if you get laid off, if you have a family business and it goes under, what's gonna happen with your health insurance? What's gonna happen with your medical bills? Um, you know, these are everyday worries regardless. Now throw in a pandemic. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's some, you know, people would, my patients would say to me flat out, it's just too much. It's too much without COVID, put COVID in, it's just too much. Um, and then I said before, maintaining a safe household, when you have too many cooks in the kitchen, too many people home, you have dad home and he leaves his shoes in the middle of the hallway, which normally aren't there and someone trips or falls, or there's a safety guard on something and your 10 year old is home and doesn't know how to close it properly. And, you know, or something, and somebody falls or somebody hits their head. Um, so there's a lot of things that you'd have to be on top of when you have everybody home, especially other kids and siblings. Okay, this is the biggest thing, the change in routine and the change in the structure of your day. So let's take Gervais syndrome out of this for a second. When COVID hit, I am a very structured, routine-oriented person. It is the only way I can get through my life. And I know that. And when this happened, my entire structure went out the window. Work, school for kids. Um, everybody we just had a technical difficulty and we're trying to to get dr zuckerman uh back on so it'll be just a second you me okay. where did i leave up where'd you where'd i get cut off i think just at the beginning of the slide okay pretty recently okay um mm -hmm. We heard you say that your schedule was disrupted. Okay. So schedule was disrupted separate from COVID, um, which is really difficult to have to deal with, obviously. So as human beings, the way our brains work, our brains crave structure and routine because our brains are lazy and we take shortcuts, especially when we're anxious. So when we're very stressed out or we're depressed, we take what's called cognitive heuristics. So we tend to think all or nothing because it's easier, it's less taxing on our brains. When we have things structured and, and scheduled out, it's less emotionally taxing on us because we don't have to expend that cognitive energy towards that. So in general, structures and, and schedules are very helpful for us because it allows us to take our cognitive effort and put it towards other things that are more important. When COVID came into play, our routines as parents, as caregivers, as, as patients completely just went out the window and nobody knew how to handle this, nobody knew. So we were all kind of scrambling last minute. When you have a strict medication schedule, like a lot of patients with Dravet syndrome do and a lot of patients with neurological illnesses do, you cannot miss doses. So imagine if you remembered as a parent or a caregiver that these medications were taken right after breakfast, right before you walked out the door, but now there's a changed breakfast time and there's nowhere to go. So there's no walking out the door. All of your medication reminders that you had set up that you never thought about, they're gone. So now you need to backtrack and you need to put into place new structures to remind you to take medications, right? New structures. Um, of when to eat your meals because certain meals have to be eaten with certain medications and certain foods um, and then sleep. And we know this with seizures, sleep plays such a huge role. And when your schedule is off and you don't have something to wake up to, your body just kind of falls behind a little bit. And so sleep was the number one thing that got disrupted through all of this. People were having insomnia complaints they would sleep during the day because they were bored. They didn't have anything to do. They, 
They weren't working out like they used to. They weren't getting out of their house. They weren't meeting their friends. They had no breaks in their day. So the monotony of just being in your house, you kind of lose track of time. And when your brain loses track of time, um, you know, that structure goes away. And then the anxiety kicks in. And then you know that when you're anxious, what happens to your thinking? That's when forgetfulness starts. And so, again, when you're dealing with something that must have a rigid schedule to it, this um, the, the, the impact of COVID had a significant impact on everybody's schedule. Um, for caregivers, it decreased your rest of the time substantially. Outings were limited due to social distancing and restrictions. Maybe every Tuesday morning you had coffee with girlfriends and just talk about life. Now you can't do that. Um, you can do it over Zoom, but that physical connection, the actual getting out of your house and getting into your car. I remember, I don't think I changed out of sweatpants for probably a good two months. And I went to get in my car just to drive around the block and I hadn't gotten in my car for two months. And it was the most awkward feeling. And you, and you realize just how out of everything you really were and how awkward it felt. So things shifted so drastically, even stupid things. Maybe once a month you went and you got your nails done because it was like your 15 minutes to yourself. Can't do that now. You went to dinners, you went to lunches, you got coffee, you went to the gym, you had your book club. Can't do that now. Yes, you can do it on Zoom, but it's just not the same. Why? Because you're home in the context that you're trying to get a break from. So your brain is still on high alert. Your brain is still in fight or flight mode because you are still on guard because you're in the same triggering environment. Um, and then the in-home help was halted. Family, friends, nurses, OT, PT, people that would come into your houses. I mean, sometimes they still did because it was essential, but in a lot of situations it was put on hold. Um, you know, my daughter had speech therapy that was not considered essential. It was put on hold. For months, she's still not back. Um, I'm gonna skip through this. This is just um, about caregivers. Just know, as you already do know, that um, people that provide, and I, I kind of laugh at this, but 36 or more hours of caregiving a week puts you at higher risk for depression or anxiety. Um, 36 hours to caregivers feels like half their day. So, <clears throat> so your mental health. When you're dealing with being a caregiver, your mental health takes a back seat. That's where I come in. Um, I'm constantly working with people on not feeling guilty to take care of their mental health. I'm working with people to understand that even though they don't feel anxious or depressed because they're constantly going, 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 the body's going to break down. So I teach them to look at physical sensations rather than emotional, um, emotional feelings or thoughts that they're having because it's easier for them to focus on my neck hurts, my back hurts, my stomach hurts, um, I'm constipated, or I have a migraine, I'm not sleeping. Um, isolation was a big thing. When you're a caregiver and you can't leave your house and you have no extra help and everybody is home with you, it, it, it's a really bad feeling, right? And so Imagine that plus being a caregiver. So now you're isolated because you have to be because viral transmission, it's not, it's not an option. Um, it's just not an option. Feeling like no one understands you, which probably you feel often anyway. Um, it's a club that nobody wants to be in. And so when you're in that club, you have your people, but you're not always with your club. And so being in this pandemic really separated people from their club, I like to call it. Um, and you need people outside of your family. You just do because you, you need people that go through this from a different standpoint. You need to be able to bounce ideas off people. You need to be able to just vent to somebody who is objective, who will not judge you, who will not tell you stop worrying, who's just going to listen. And a lot of times, and this is where the marriage piece comes in, I mean, I could ask my husband the same question 50 times over again, and it looks like he's got ready to kill me. Um, but when you're dealing with something that is, is so anxiety provoking, you're going to seek reassurance. When you're home because of COVID, guess who you're gonna continuously seek reassurance from? Your significant other, even your kids, you're gonna call family members on the phone. So your needs are gonna to start to look a little bit different. They're gonna become a little bit more reassurance seeking. 
then worry, finances, job, insurance, um, your health in general, because you can't get to the doctor either. Um, additional stressors that come into play, conflicts with spouses and extended family. Um, again, grandparents were getting extremely angry. They were not allowed to come over to see grandkids. Um, family members were not allowed to come over to people's houses. And if you have a child with chronic illness, you're not letting anybody in your house, period, um, unless it's an emergency. So people that don't understand may get a little kind of antsy about that and get on you about that. Something that um, I remember hearing on the news and I, 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 might, I, I felt my body just cringe. There was a press conference and they were saying how domestic violence during COVID went up and child abuse went down. And I sat there going, well, of course child abuse went down because there's no one in school. So there's no one to report it. <laughs> like, it, so if you think about it, when you're already stressed as it is, and you're dealing with somebody who is, you know, who's a caregiver and their sole job is to take care of their child who has a chronic illness, you can't leave your house and you're in the middle of a pandemic. It's really hard sometimes to feel like you're not going to snap and just lose it. And so people started drinking more. People started taking a little bit more of their Xanax, right? That they shouldn't have. People started taking a little bit more of their Ativan. People started having a cocktail earlier and earlier in the day. And when you have that level of stress, especially of taking care of a child who is sick, um, it is unfortunately more common than not that abuse is going to start to spike. Verbal abuse, physical abuse especially. Um, a lot of parents start to feel shame. Caregivers feel this anyway. They feel shame that they don't feel like taking care of the person they're taking care of anymore. And what I work with them on is understanding that it's just a thought. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a thought. You have to look at your behaviors. Are your behaviors in line with what you value? If the answer is yes, then the thought is just fleeting. Um, so I said substance abuse went up um, and physical illness. And once you get sick, then you're unable to provide care for others. Um, just quickly, I'm gonna go through the components of stress so you know what to look for. Typically with stress, there's three main components. There's the physiological piece of it, which is your racing heart, your shallow breathing. Cognitive, which are your thoughts. Um, I am a behavior therapist, so I don't put as much stock in thoughts and feelings. I do, but we have to change behaviors first. And as a result of the new experience, then your thoughts and your feelings change. We can't think our way out of a thought, even if it hurts. We can't feel our way out of a feeling, even if it feels terrible. Um, and then behaviors, either we're avoiding something or we're moving towards it. It is that simple. So what we look for, what I look for physically with caregivers in terms of caregiver stress, particularly within COVID, feeling exhausted more so than normal, lack of energy, any difficulty breathing, blood pressure issues, racing heart, grinding teeth, as far as cognition goes, blaming others, having difficulty making decisions, like what are we gonna have for breakfast? Things that are just benign decisions. Feeling out of control because you can't leave your house and you have no control over this illness that's going on outside of you, let alone the illness that you have going on in your home because you are at the mercy of diet and medications, right, and, and hope. So, you know, it, it not only do you now have to manage feeling out of control with that, but now you have to put on top of that, this pandemic that came out of left field. Confusion, um, a lot of times, you know, people say, I think I'm having memory loss. I think I have early onset dementia. No, you have anxiety and depression and anxiety and depression, it can interfere with our memory. And that tension is usually one of the first things to go with anxiety and depression. Emotional, as caregivers, you know, guilt, anxiety, grief. Um, I can't do this on my own. I'm not a good wife or mother. I'm angry. There's a lot of resentment. And this went through the roof during COVID because if one parent was an essential worker and left the house and the other parent wasn't, and that parent didn't go to work anymore, say they worked in retail, 
They're home now, 24 seven, being the caregiver. There's no one to split it. There's no one to take over. Um, and that goes with irritability. And like I said, that increases abuse. Behaviors, so things to look for if you're a caregiver and things to look for in your significant other or other caregivers that help you out. If you find yourself withdrawing from others, during COVID, obviously we're all withdrawing from others, but if you're not returning text messages, not returning phone calls, you know, not FaceTiming people anymore, um, not doing things that you usually enjoy, like things that you can do in your house again, because that shifted. So gardening, things around the house, reading a book, watching your shows, um, cleaning the house, eating more or less than usual, increased substance use, lack of sleep or any type of nightmares. Um, so in general, Depression, helplessness, hopelessness, and anxiety are things that caregivers are extremely at extremely high risk for. Put COVID into the mix, the risk just went up even more. So these are the things that you really wanna look for and look for in others. I'm gonna say more so look for in others because it's really difficult when you're depressed to be able to see that you're depressed. And it's difficult to, to know that you're anxious if you're kind of always on the go, on the go, on the go. So it's helpful for other people to notice that. Um, look for warning signs. Do you feel like you're yelling a lot more? Do you have an urge to hurt somebody in your house? Again, it's just a thought. It's just an urge. It's not real unless it becomes a behavior. Are you taking too many of your prescribed medications? Are you not showering as much? Um, are you forgetting to pay your bills, cleaning, shopping, things like that? Um, it's important also not to neglect our male caregivers Male caregivers will deal with depression differently. Um, they're less likely to get diagnosed. They're more likely to self-medicate. They're more likely to self-treat themselves. Um, and they don't have as many supportive people. So a lot of caregivers, um, they're primarily women. And so the men during COVID, if we have more traditional roles with this, and they were essential workers, like I said, they were at work. If they're not essential workers, they were more likely out of the house than the women were. Sadness and crying that won't go away, increased physical sickness, um, change in sleep and eating patterns. So coping mechanisms in general when you're a caregiver look one way. Coping mechanisms during COVID look a different way because we're limited in what we can do. So things that you can do on your own that don't involve any type of outsiders or going outside or having to step outside your front door. PMR is progressive muscle relaxation. So body scanning, tightening your muscles for 10 seconds, slowly relaxing. You can do this anywhere. You can sit in your garage. You can sit in your car and do this. Um, breathing retraining. Most people breathe wrong. They don't realize that. Most people, when they take a deep breath in, their stomach goes in. It's actually the opposite. So think of a balloon. And I always tell people to think about their favorite color. So it gives them something kind of to focus on. It's easier to focus on a color. So think of a blue balloon. When you breathe in, you want to blow the balloon up in your stomach. When you breathe out, then you want to deflate it. Most people breathe the opposite. When you breathe the opposite, you're not getting enough oxygen. You're going to kind of increase the likelihood of anxiety for a lot of physiological reasons because of that. So make sure you're breathing properly. Proper nutrition. This got impacted by COVID because we couldn't get the resources that we needed. People's finances tanked. Um, exercise, people went to the gym, couldn't do that anymore. So now people who wanted to work out, they may not have the room in their house. They may not have the equipment in their house. They may not have the time. It may have been something that got them out of the house. So maybe we wanted to do something in our garage or in our backyard or down the street, somewhere outside of your house. Scheduling of pleasurable events is a big thing for depression and anxiety. Clearly COVID messed that up. So figure out pleasurable events that you can do for yourself that do not involve anybody else that you can do safely during COVID for yourself and the person that you're taking care of and get creative with this. You know, this could be, um, you know, you and your child FaceTiming or doing a Zoom call with a grandparent and doing a virtual tour of um, a museum, like a kid's museum or watching a movie together online or, um, there was tons of um, 
celebrities reading stories to kids. That could have been something that you do. So things that you enjoy doing or just things for yourself, having nothing to do with, with your kids. Therapy, um, since this happened, all my therapy has been virtual. So um, I'm still seeing patients. I'm still seeing, still taking new patients. Um, therapy has been extremely effective for people during COVID because it gives them an outlet. It gives them a place to feel safe and it gives them their own space within their, their four walls that they can't really leave. <clears throat> Some practical strategies to reduce caregiver stress during COVID. I'm a big fan of practical strategies, things that you can do in your own time um, you want to make sure that you record. We are the worst reporters of our own behavior. We think we're going to remember. We're not going to remember. If I asked you to tell me how many times you sneeze a day, you would swear that you would remember after every sneeze. I would bet my house on it that you won't remember. So make sure any type of aches, pains, headaches, um, sleeping, anything that starts to shift, write it down because it's easier to start to see the shift and the pattern change in your physical, um, your physical health than thinking about it. You wanna make a list of all your caregiving duties because now that you have more people home with you, you can delegate. So that's a good thing, but people can't read your mind. They don't know what you do on a day-to-day -day basis if they're not home. So you really wanna write out your caregiving responsibilities. Utilize all aspects of your support network that you have. If you have people home and it's safe and they understand what they're doing, use them. Um, this is a way for you to get a break when you can't physically leave your house. So take advantage of people being home. Identify tasks that are easier to help, easier to ask for help for. A lot of caregivers have a lot of difficulty asking for help because they feel guilt. Make a list of the things you need help with. Start with the thing that makes you feel the least guilty and start with that one. So maybe picking up paper towels, you can delegate that, you're fine with that. So that's the one you give to somebody to do for you. As restrictions start getting lifted, you can start to do that more and more. This is something that is good for you regardless of COVID. You just have access now to more people because more people are around. Um, I always say this in general, <clears throat> always stay in touch with HR at your work. They must know what's going on. They don't need to know details, but they need to know that sometimes you're gonna need to take off. And when you're in that need to take off mode, it's usually some sort of crisis and you're not thinking clearly and you don't wanna have to explain things over and over again. So make sure they have all your information ahead of time. Have your emergency contacts list, list with you. And for people that are home with you now during COVID, make sure they have these emergency contacts and make sure you update your emergency contacts now that you may have different people helping you, a different routine, a different structure. <clears throat> um, you still wanna make sure you schedule things with friends. Maybe you do a Zoom dinner, family dinner with your neighbors. Let's say you did family dinners once a week with a neighbor. You can still do that, do it over Zoom. Everything that you did socially, you can do now over Zoom for the most part. Um, Things to consider, family roles. Everybody has their own role within their family as far as caregiving goes. This again became very confusing and muddy during COVID because the routine of caregiving again was changed and it was challenged. And so there's a lot of unspoken rules in families. And now that you may have more than one person in the house, these unspoken rules need to be spoken or else there's gonna be a lot of trying to read other people's minds and a lot of resentment and a lot of miscommunication. The biggest thing I can tell you during COVID when you're dealing with caregiving issues is there is absolutely no right or wrong. Do not judge yourself to another family member or another family who's going through caregiving as well during COVID. Different situations, different family, different needs. Be very mindful of that and try not to judge yourself against others. Always ask for help. Do not wait until you are in crisis mode to ask for help because then you play catch up. Ask when you don't need help so that you don't get into that point where you feel like you're drowning. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Zuckerman. Um, 
we don't have time for questions right now. I can tell you that I went over. <laughs> I can tell you that watching the comments, I think so much of what you said resonated with so many people. I think we're all going to be going back to rewatch this talk again and share it with our families to try to help them understand. Um, I see so many people feeling so validated. Um, if by anyone all- has questions, by all means, feel free to email me. Um, and I'm happy to answer all of them. Great. Thank you so much for being sure. here. For this really meaningful talk. Um, we appreciate it so much. Thank you guys for having me.